Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Marshall. I am the head of exhibitions and programs here at the George Eastman Museum. It has been exactly 600 days since I've last stood in front of a studio audience, or a theater audience. I um, feel like I'm at a studio audience, like I'm on TV or something here. Uh, it's been 600 days, exactly, since the last uh, in-person talk presentation that we've had in the theater. Uh, <laughs> over those 600 days, we have immensely appreciated your participation and flexibility as we've navigated new terrain in the virtual world. There are many great aspects to online programming that allow for unique and engaging opportunities. So our goal moving forward is to have a hybrid approach to our programming calendar that incorporates both in-person and virtual events. With that said, to say that I am happy to be back in front of you all would be an understatement. It's so great to see your faces uh, in real life again, <laughs> or at least parts of your faces. Uh, and so I, I really just want to thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, complying with our, our current safety policies. Um, just as a reminder, we do ask that all guests wear their masks throughout the entirety of the program and while indoors at the museum. Uh, our speaker this evening will be taking their mask off since they will be speaking for an extended period of time. Uh, in an effort to ensure safety, we've blocked off the seats closest to the uh, lectern here, and uh, we've installed my television screen here uh, to help uh, uh, keep everybody safe. Um, now, uh, on to tonight's program. For those of you that are not familiar with our Wish You Were Here Artist Talk series, it started in 2001, and since then has been very generously funded by Dr. Thomas Tischer whose name may be familiar to many of you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom, Tom's name is probably familiar to many of you uh, as he has been funding this program for many years um, and is also uh, a major funder for our uh, new entrance project, which we are very thankful for both of those things. Tom, thank you. This year's uh, Wish You Were Here series is a bit different than the past 21 years. Uh, not just because of the Plexi Shield, uh, but because uh, all of our speakers uh, this year reside here in Rochester and are integral parts of our art and photography community. I'm excited to kick off the series with tonight's speaker, Granville Carroll. Granville is an educator and Afrofuturist photographer whose work has been exhibited throughout the United States and featured on multiple online platforms such as Phases Mag, Phases Mag, Art Doc Magazine, Humble Arts Foundation, Lens Scratch, Photo Emphasis, and Float Photo. He received his BFA in photography from Arizona State University and his MFA in photography from a little place called Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, in addition to uh, Granville's work uh, as an artist and educator, he uh, also uh, is a staff member here at the museum. So we're excited to be able to have him here uh, more frequently uh, and to hear, uh, to ha always have chances to have conversation with him about his work and uh, really uh, enjoy working with him. So uh, after the presentation, we'll have a little bit of time for a Q&A, hopefully. Um, so uh, feel free to stick around for that, and please join me in welcoming Granville Carroll. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Nick. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> and hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight for this talk and devoting your time and energy to be here. I want to thank the George Eastman Museum and Nick Marshall for inviting me to share my photographic journey with you all. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Thomas Tischer for graciously supporting this event. Tonight, I will be taking you all on a journey through darkness and light, hope and freedom, to a place where reality, space and time contracts and expands upon itself. So you may question, what does the veil represent exactly? The veil can be many things. 
It is commonly understood as a space in religion and spirituality that separates the physical and spiritual realm. <clears throat> in this context, an individual or community seeks to peer beyond the physical realm in search of the mystical and the divine. Lifting the veil can mean a greater conscious awareness. The veil can also represent anything that blinds our psyche, that shackles us to misunderstanding, ignorance, judgment, or hate. And it can simply represent the literal act of looking beyond a piece of fabric. The veil I speak of is multidimensional. Through photography and writing, I explore this multidimensionality to understand holistically what it means to be human, what it means to exist and bear witness to the vibratory expression of life and how blackness enters into these experiences. I find myself often questioning who I am, how the world will look upon me, and how I see myself in the midst of it all. My existence is bound to the issues of representation and identity. As a black self-portrait photographer, my darker skin usually sits at the forefront. Expectations, perspectives, and judgments are projected onto me as I move through this world. My work addresses this difficult relationship with how the world sees me and how I see myself. It is a deeply personal journey that I have embarked on, but it is not one that is specific to just me. Racial labeling, sexuality, gender, socioeconomic status, and so much more are all constructs that affect us in one way or another. My work seeks to break down these veils in order to understand who the self is in relation to cosmology and the divine. When we strip ourselves of these constructs, what lies beneath it all? And so before I dive into the images, I want to begin with a poem that I wrote that questions and reaffirms my existence in an endless manner. Who am I but a mass the world places upon me? Am I only blackness and shadows? Can this mask connect me to a time when I was just human? Who am I but a mask the world places upon me? Is it ritual or oppression? Is it my true existence or an illusion? Am I able to release myself from this paradox, from this existential pain of flatness? Am I? I am. I am the mass I place upon myself. I am the mass representing a collapse of time, a ritual embedded in the map of my soul, blackness as origin point. In darkness, light is born. In darkness, heavens are held. I am the mass representing a shattered world of illusion, gilded fragments resting at the edge of the universe, bound by the invisible force of dark matter. I am the mask of duality, representing the liminal space of something and nothing. Am I? I am. The space between all things is an interesting concept to ponder. What does it mean exactly, and what does it look like? There's no real definition or vision for this place. It shifts and transforms. It is undergoing a constant metamorphosis, and in the center of this liminal space is the ever-changing and multidimensional self. The work I'm going to share with you tonight is all bound by a common thread and question. What does it mean to be human? I have my own history to contend with. My collective history is rooted in and bound by the slave trade. In addition to this, I must also contend with my personal history and upbringing, such as being exposed to Christianity as a foundation for my life, constantly moving and adapting, and being isolated as a black person in a white-centered world. The work I create begins to shift perspectives and allow the mind to manifest and construct new realities and identities. These stem from a distant past and the present moment and are projected into the unknown future. I reflect upon my past histories to understand where I have come from and where I'm going next. <clears throat> I'm the heir to a legacy of death and destruction brought on by European colonization. My story, as told through the history books of America, begins with violence and displacement. But I'm also the heir to a legacy of strength and endurance, passion, innovation, and imagination. My ancestors chose to look beyond the veil of captivity, slavery, and attacks on personal sovereignty 
which has allowed me and others to exist today. They believed in the impossible, and with that concept in mind, I also dream of the impossible. A world where race is not distinctive of an individual, and we can collectively begin to understand our human origins and how we come together and why we are all here. As I journey to understand the self in relation to the origins of existence, I can't help but find these parallels to the emptiness of space in the African diaspora. Blackness as a racial construct has been demonized and villainized. It is often associated with fear, disdain, inferiority, and many other negative connotations. That is why I employ the use of Afrofuturism and astral blackness to help redefine and shift the narrative of blackness away from a space of detriment and into a space of creation, power, and origin stories. So for those who are unfamiliar with Afrofuturism, it is a framework used by creatives and scholars to redefine the black identity. Amongst other topics, Afrofuturism is primarily focused on science fiction, technology, and the imagination. Astroblackness is the 21st century version of Afrofuturism, often referred to as Afrofuturism 2.0. Afrofuturism 2.0 is said to include five specific dimensions, and these dimensions are metaphysics, aesthetics, theoretical and applied science, social science, and programmatic spaces. It is important to note that I situate my work in the dimension of metaphysics, which looks at the ontology and meaning of existence and cosmology, the origins of the universe. And so let's begin there, at the beginning of time, reality, and history. I present to you my project, Cosmotypes. This is a series of wet plate collodion images created on mostly aluminum plates, but also on acrylic and glass. These images depict the creation of new worlds, universes, and cosmic spaces. I wanted to create a series of images where the self was liberated from its corporeal prison and able to traverse the depths and complexities of cosmic space. I wanted to see the single point in which the universe erupted into existence. I wanted to witness who or what sits at the apex of creation. I initially sought out to re-photograph images sourced from NASA's Hubble telescope. I successfully made a few plates, but ultimately had to change my process as the exposure times were too long and inhibited an image from developing. This failure at first was quite devastating, but ultimately, ultimately it became a gift. I experimented with various ways to recreate starscapes using water droplets, charcoal, and dirt. The results were interesting, but it did not reflect what I saw in my mind's eye. I then decided to create starscapes using foil, my iPhone's flashlight, and shadow. A simple process in nature, but nevertheless, it had an immensely profound impact on the way these images came to be. I was shocked, surprised, <clears throat> and excited upon seeing the first cosmotypes in the series. I had created a new universe. I was thrilled at what this can mean. I proceeded to develop more and more images, allowing the power of my existence to flow through me to manifest these newly constructed dimensions and worlds. In this process, I became a creator, and I pondered how the universe might have felt upon seeing itself reflected for the first time. There is a saying that we are all made of stardust, and as cliche as it may sound, I took this quite literally. Me, a product of stars being born and dying, matter coming together, and sequences of DNA co all coalescing to allow me to witness the birth of new universes. These cosmotypes gifted me with what I desired. It allowed me to feel the freedom of creation and destruction, of control and surrender. I sought out liberation from the body and found freedom in the emptiness of space, blackness as origin point. This origin point is the void, the space in which nothing happens. Yet, the void is still something. It is a concept that I use to hold space for all that exists. I think about the blank plates as the void. There is nothing there but infinite possibility. The surface acts as a plane of existence and reality, the foundation for all that is. It is void of life, matter, and energy until I enact my vision upon it. These images take me back to the various origin stories I have heard from many cultures. The biblical origin story is what I grew up with. The voice or thought of God manifested the physical world we exist in. 
created the waters and land and split the day and split the world into day and night. This act of manifesting is also said to be given to us as we speak and allow our thoughts to become reality. This is the gift that I speak of, to be able to use this ability of manifestation to imagine new worlds and bring them into fruition. What started as an ephemeral thought has now become reality, the impossible made possible. And so I watched worlds unfold before my eyes. I saw matter crystallize and become form. Light is said to give birth to form, but in reality, it is both the darkness and the light that gives birth to form. The cosmotypes create a place, a meeting place, where chaos connects to order, and light is birthed from the void of blackness. I set my gaze on the expanse of space, marveling at the vibratory dance of light and darkness. In this space, I felt the body dissolve into points of light and spaces of, dark, of blackness that will forever be a part of a larger and more complex history than we are capable of currently knowing or understanding. Humanity's origin story has yet to be uncovered. We are fixated on making the unknown known. This project investigates the idea of cosmology from a scientific perspective. It observes in simple detail one possibility for how the universe was constructed. Some force of will acted upon the void and set everything into motion. It also explores cosmology from a personal and spiritual perspective. I see my artistic practice as an act of, medita of meditation. The act of creation grounds me in the present while allowing me the balance to reach into the past and future. I meditated on my personal upbringing and why I feel the need to recreate new worlds and, re and realities. I asked myself why this journey was so important. And the answer I found is to reclaim my personal power in sovereignty. These images depict the struggle between control and surrender. As humans existing in an ever expanding universe, how much control do we really have? The only control we have is over our minds. The mind is a powerful entity that can manifest its deepest desires and darkest fears. Each image is unique. I cannot replicate the exact same image, even if I use the same piece of foil, which acts as a template for the stars. I didn't know how each image would come out after its exposure, and so it reinforced in me the balance between control and surrender. As I created these images, I thought about this sense of control and surrender in relation to the power, in relation to the power of the imagination. When presented with limitations, how does one transcend the issue and find a solution. The world has constantly told us how we should think, what we should believe in, what labels and definitions are appropriate for our use, and so much more. I realize I cannot control the way the world will, I cannot control the way the world will react to me in my blackness, but I can control the output of my existence. My body is embedded in the blackness that surrounds the newly crafted stars, celestial bodies, and gaseous forms. My blackness no longer becomes a product of racial labeling, but of power, creation, and origins. I surrender to the forces of nature, but also enact my will upon it to manifest these new worlds. The desire to create something from nothing, to move through the space of the unknown, and conquer oppression is empowering. There is power and strength in seeing yourself reflected in the, st in the stars. There is power in understanding the gift of the mind and to fortify it with the imagination, hope, and dreams. And so I would like to introduce you to my project, <clears throat> Because the Sun Have Looked Upon Me. This project continues the ontological exploration of the self in relation to the whole of creation. The cosmotypes sought out to liberate the body from its social constructs and definitions. <clears throat> this project further explores how one is able to define, define their own identity regardless of, of their race, cultural background, sexuality, gender, etc. Specifically, this project looks at identity construction through the intersection of cosmology, philosophy, and spirituality. Because the sun had looked upon me was a response to my identity and practice being reduced to nothing but the black experience. The narrative and expectation around black artists producing work solely about the black experience is reductive. 
I grew tired of hearing this, of people assuming they understood the work from a single perspective. Because the sun had looked upon me shows a multidimensional self, newly crafted landscapes and visions of the promised land. Art has an amazing ability to reconstruct thought and perspective. As I ventured into an internal landscape, I began to restructure my entire world and place in it. I revisited Zen Buddhism and meditation, going beyond my religious upbringing. I infused the work with ideas from liquid blackness, research developed by Dr. Alessandra Rango and her team at Georgia State Univers University, which expands the ways we interact with blackness as a society. I embedded philosophical ideas of eminence to bring together opposing viewpoints and return to African cosmology to understand the world from another point of view. The work deals with topics of race as a rebuttal against the hold race politics and ideologies have on our entire world. I use syncretism to create a hybrid way of living and expressing one's identity. And so the title for this project comes from the Hebrew Bible, the book, uh, the book Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse six, that states, look not upon me because I am black, because the sun had looked upon me. This biblical passage references, references the sun's ability to darken skin, but it is so much more than that. I am a black man, but that is not all that I am. I use this passage to reaffirm my existence and deep connection to the celestial bodies that guide and direct the lives of many. My mother raised us with the Christian faith, but she did not limit the way we interacted with the divine. She did not have a dogmatic approach to religion, which I'm eternally grateful for. She developed her own personal relationship with spirituality and allowed us to form our own paths. As I grew into my mind, I began to really question the Christian faith and its values. I also questioned it in relation to colonization and the African diaspora in America. This led me to explore various spiritual paths to find meaning, value, and connection to the world. I personally do not follow one specific spiritual path, but instead find connections and meaning in multiple, in multiple pathways, one in which is in Buddhism and meditation. Specifically, the notion of interbeing became significant to me in the process of unraveling my personal and collective history. Interbeing understands the world without separation. Self cannot exist alone. All things coalesce to help the other exist. The self exists with, within nature, its symbiotic relationship extending from the microcosm to the macrocosm. In this sense, my blackness is not isolated to the negative constructs created by society. It blends into the depths of the cosmos, my body connected to the earth and my mind free to explore the vastness of cosmic space. I see no separation between the body, the internal landscape of my mind, and the external landscape of the world. Our society thrives off the idea of separation and individuality. I wanted to explore a relationship that was more balanced, less about superiority and inferiority, and more on how all things work together. I wanted to experience harmony, even if it only existed in my mind. Believing in the interconnectedness of existence is hard when social constructs try to break down and separate you from that truth. I grew up in predominantly white areas and was hyper aware of my blackness. The stares, the judgments, hateful words and comments were a lot to bear. Being called stupid for being black, being shunned because of my blackness, being mislabeled and judged all for my blackness. These experiences created a sense of isolation Instead of participating in a world where I was constantly being rejected, I imagined new worlds and explored them in my mind. It wasn't until I was much older that I began to address these experiences and understand that the worlds I create now are visions of my childhood dreams. In these moments of rejection, nature acted as a sanctuary to escape the fiery darts of society. Because the sun had looked upon me is an examination of my shift from a negative state of isolation to a positive state of solitude, from a point of separation to deep connection. My personal trauma led me in search of a promised land where I could find myself after being broken by the world. The landscapes I build act as those spaces of rest and contemplation. This image is one of my favorites. I remember photographing the sandy shore of Lake Ontario one night 
and thinking about how it mimicked the stars. I was standing in a bed of star-like lights, glistening and connecting me to everything above. These moments project me backwards into time, <clears throat> conjuring memories of when I was a child, always embracing nature and wanting to find myself reflected in it. I grew up in Western Washington and explored the wonders of the outdoors. My siblings and I would go on adventures and pretend we were explorers of new worlds. This experience cultivated a deep curiosity of nature and the mysteries of the universe. I would constantly look up at the night sky and imagine what exists beyond my reach. I was always looking upward, hoping to find a connection to something much larger than myself. I found myself completely enthralled by the wonders and mysteries of what might exist within the vastness of space. It was in the night sky that I found peace and solace and a connection to the divine. Spirituality and nature spurred me to see the world as more than just matter. These experiences prompted me to look upon the world as a blank canvas, a surface on which I can project, create, and reimagine what I see. The sky, the ground, and horizon became powerful symbols. The ground representing the physical world, the sky a canvas for projection and imagination, and the horizon acting as a liminal space between the physical and ethereal. And so even still as an adult, I return to nature's bosom to find peace and reconnection. I pull back the veil and share with the world my, share with the world the inner workings of my mind. I make myself vulnerable to share my inner bliss. This is an act of rebellion against a world that demands suffering to be my existence. I combine and manipulate images to visually express what exists in my mind. The result is an amalgamation of places, realities, and times. These are dreams and visions of new worlds where race is deconstructed and removed. What exists in these spaces are possibilities, the hope for growth and reverence for the natural world and cosmic matter. My practice involves being a co-creator of reality. I use the indexical nature of photography and the power of the imagination to realize new worlds. I construct these new spaces and landscapes that allow for growth and expansion. They may appear to be desolate and empty, but this is not to show only the struggle of finding oneself, but to show how emptiness can act as a space of possibility. And so you'll notice a common theme running throughout my conceptual thinking the void, the unknown, and the space of possibility. And I want to return to the study of cosmology, which is a study of the universe in totality. It is a branch of astronomy that attempts to answer the question of humanity's origins and the evolution of the universe. Because of the vastness and constant expansion of space, it feels almost impossible to uncover the secrets of the universe and fully understand what is happening. Space is expanding, Time is relative to our pale blue dot, and we are constantly observing the past, only ever seeing the light that existed billions of years ago. Collectively, humanity's origin story is unreachable. However, within this space exist the multiplicities of the unknown and the known, light and dark, matter and antimatter. And so when I compare the history of the African diaspora to the study of cosmology, I see these direct parallels. Both exist within the void of nothingness, the unknown in the space of possibility. My history has been viciously destroyed and is never obtainable. It does not matter how far I reach back into the past. I cannot recover the traditions, stories, and connections to my ancestral heritage before my people were enslaved. This is a sad realization to know that I will never be able to fully connect to the culture and past of whichever nation or tribe I come from. However, as with most things that are destroyed, they come back in new form. I use art and photography as a way to envision a new origin story, one that is constructed from the most primal and deeply powerful forces that we know of, the emptiness and energy of cosmic space. I reclaim the space of emptiness and fill it with new life, landscapes, and identities. The cosmos is the space where I can contemplate these questions to explore infinite possibilities. The blackness of space acts as the foundation of life and is integral to the way I think about my identity as a black man. I explore what it means for blackness to be understood in new ways. I want blackness to be expansive, imaginative, 
bold, heroic, and imminent to life. I construct metaphorical images relating to the deeper layers of my own identity and what it means to remove the body from the physical world of matter. Blackness is paralleled with the cosmos, connecting it to the creative and destructive forces that exist in space. Blackness is the dark matter holding the universe together. Blackness refers to the transit of planets across their stars becoming silhouettes. The unknown of the cosmos is a place where I want blackness to exist. In that liminal space, blackness will always be limitless. The way blackness has been received historically has been reductive. My redefining of blackness is in, res in response to how I feel bound by the negative con constructs developed to reduce blackness to inferior nothingness. And so this image titled, Out of Nothing, is a composite figure made up of my body, only the edges of light bringing my form into existence. It explores this idea that the body is only a vessel and that we are energetic beings of light connected to the depths of the cosmos and the divine. My work is often influenced by media that I engage with, whether that be books, movies, TV shows, or music. Out of Nothing was inspired by Tommy Adeyemi's book, Children of Blood and Bone, a beautiful story that is influenced by Yoruba cosmology. It centers the main character who has the ability to use magic against a world where magic-wielding people, who are also darker-skinned, are seen as demons and heretics. In one part of the book, the main character met a sacred priest named Lekan. Lekan is described as having tattoos or markings that glowed brilliantly white when his ashe, or power, was enacted. Out of nothing is representative of the power of ashe and its ability to bring form into existence. From the stark black void emerges a figure made up of light to connect the ethereal body to divinity, while also maintaining the idea that blackness is the foundation in which all things stem from. Drawing further influence from Tomi Adeyemi's book and the Yoruba cosmological model, I created this image, Ori. Ori in the Yoruba tradition is commonly translated as the head and has significance, significant importance. The head is associated with the eternal one, Olodumare, who is the head of the cosmos, the creator of all things. It is said that Ashe is the gift of the eternal one. This power brings everything into existence. Ashe is said to give life to all living things and animates matter to become form. Using my body as a vessel, I constructed an imaginary space where this power is visualized as the cosmos. The stories of black Americans usually begins with slavery, a true origins lost to time. But I wanted to go further back than that. In Ori, I connect the black body to the source of all creation, which is speculated to come from the head of the cosmos, the eternal one. Entering this imaginary world is not an act of transcendence, but an act of imminence. It is not about going beyond the self, but merging with all that exists. And so transcendence is understood as a binary relation, and within that concept is the idea of separation. Imminence is a concept imagining existence as a totality. It seeks to overcome the dualism of subject and object. The idea of duality is reduced in the rising of unification. You cannot separate or go beyond the plane. You cannot separate or go beyond what exists within the state of imminence. Imminence, explained by Jill Deleuze, is a plane of thought that is both behind and ahead, foreground and background. Imminence is in itself, not in anything, nor can it be attributed to something. It does not depend on an object or belong to a subject. And so this embodiment of Ashe releases me from social and political pressures. Ashe creates a space where I can address being without labels and predetermined concepts developed by society. Illusions of race and its power of separation is destroyed, making way for clarity and hope to form in its absence. I connect blackness to the Yoruba tradition of Ashe, scientific dark matter, and the concept of eminence. At first glance, that may seem separate, but they all speak to a similar idea. There is an invisible force that permeates all of existence. This force cannot be separated from itself. It is in everything and nothing. Blackness is often attributed to the idea of being nothing, fearful and the unknown. Liquid blackness teaches us that blackness is not singular. It is fluid and all-encompassing. By, 
By intersecting myth, science, and philosophy, I began to reorganize my world and formulate the new ways of navigating the future. I want to reduce the idea of separate, separateness that is a result of laboring, labeling and categorization. Because the sun had looked upon me introduces a new way to perceive blackness as it continues to permeate everything in existence. In the Finite Infinitely is an expansion of, of this project because the sun had looked upon me. It has been influenced by the research I did and was partly inspired by concepts of mortality. This project began in 2020 after the pandemic hit. I did not intentionally create work in response to the pandemic, but I see how that experience has influenced how I conceptualize the work. Additionally, the rise in awareness in black issues and police brutality forced me to think about the reality of death even more and what that looks like. As an emotional response to the horrors of the world, I began to spiral down the path of samsara, the cycle of life and death, of suffering. I asked myself if this is, if this is the reality I want to live with, that we collectively as humans want to live with. Are we so blinded by our rage and our differences that we are reduced to animalistic beha behavior? This question got me thinking about humanity's next step in evolution, which led me to the transcension hypothesis, which examines the next step in human evolution and why we haven't seen intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. It explores the idea of inner expansion of space and not just outer expansion. And lastly, the initial inspiration for this project came from Michael Crichton's book, Sphere, and the ideas of manifesting our deepest fears that lead to our eventual self-destruction. And the finite infinitely accepts the reality that life is finite, but the nature of consciousness, of matter and energy, is infinite. This is a work in progress, but it begins to tell a story on how the universe was created, where humanity is at now, and where we will end up. It takes a more positive and optimistic position for the next step in humanity's evolution. In the transcension hypothesis, they speculate that other intelligent beings have not gone and expanded to outer space, but rather have transcended this dimension through inner space, the condensing of matter and information. The hypothesis proposes that it is not outer space that we should be concerned with, but inner space, black holes and the possibilities they hold. As matter and energy become smaller and smaller, its information becomes denser, which will eventually create a portal to a new sense of being. I have taken some artistic license to understand this hypothesis as not just a scientific matter to explain humanity's evolution and why we haven't met any aliens, but to explore the inner workings of the mind, humanity's origins, and where we will go next. Primordial light, which is this image here, is an image I created that depicts the source of creation. A stream of energy, light, and matter is ejected from the palms of the creator. This is what I envision when I think of the origins of humanity's existence, thus my own existence. In some other dimension or world exists a figure that manifests and conducts matter to shape into new worlds and realities. And in that same vein, the one who can also transmute matter and destroy what was in order to create something new. Returning to my influence from Michael Crichton's book, Sphere, I was intrigued by the idea that a sphere could be the culprit in causing so much devastation. It left me thinking what would happen if the power of manifestation was used from a more positive light. It also conjured ideas on sacred geometry and the, and the symbolic nature of the circle. The circle representing unity and the infinite, the beginning and the end. And so I returned to my research in West African Yoruba cosmology to understand the significance of the circle. The Calabash of Existence is a cultural and cosmological framework that contemplates the creation and structure of the universe. It is made up of two halves, the base and the lid. It is depicted as a three-dimensional sphere. The lid represents the sky or heavens and is where Olodumare, Olodumare and the Orishas or deities reside. The bottom half represents the physical world of the living or the earth. In this infinite cycle exists the balance between the feminine and the masculine. It connects the sacred to the secular. I imagine again how the universe sees itself reflected in its own creation. I find myself in reverie, observing the creation of all that is, was, and will be. I often am lost in idealism, 
dreaming of a world where the body is not confined by physical limitations. As I remember waking up one morning last year with a sensation that I could fly, I felt light and free, and I couldn't shake this feeling. And I questioned where it came from. I didn't immediately remember this dream, and then one day, I remembered in vivid detail the dream I had. I remember, I remember standing on a sidewalk with people all around me. The background was not what you would expect. I did not see blue skies, streets, or any other recognizable shapes. I was standing there in the midst of darkness, but able to see as clear as day. Then at one point, I began to lightly flap my arms and then started to float. The people around me looked in awe as I slowly ascended to the heavens. This was such a visceral reaction that it freaked me out. To have a dream so vivid that it affected my waking consciousness was unlike any other experience I have ever had. I truly felt as if I had the ability to fly, to leave the, this physical plane at any point I wish. I felt so weightless and boundless. My mind was free to roam and explore the wonders of the universe. It was a freedom that I could not fully express in words. So I memorialized it in this image, showing the celestial body coalescing in darkness and light. This image is, is symbolic of the mind's ability to create new sensations and perspectives in the body. The activity of my brain as my body lay dormant transported me to new dimensions. It dawned on me, is this what it feels like to die? Do we feel a deep sensation of weightlessness in our con when our conscious mind and body disconnect? To be honest, I have no clue, but this thought intrigued me. So I began to explore this feeling of weightlessness. I continued to construct and manifest other visions of creation, death, identity, and everything in between. I created images showing the body emerging from the mandalas, acting as portals to new worlds and dimensions. Allowing the body to be consumed by cosmic forces and reconfigured into new physical and spiritual forms. I saw my body become a conduit for the forces of the cosmos and the transmutation of matter over time. Matter stemming from the essential point of blackness, converging and diverging as the observer sets its gaze upon it. I felt matter and energy fluctuate and crystallize into form. I imagined black bodies emerging from the depths of the cosmos, its presence bending light, space, and time. I imagined moving through existence, non-existence, and presence, filling the painful embrace of the universe's infer inferno and the healing powers of the imagination. Twenty twenty was a year of reckoning that affected our mental states quite dramatically. I had to understand that the person I once was was now gone. The life we all became comfortable with was now gone, forever changed. Collectively, we all entered a new state, stage of existence that felt restrictive, scary, and dangerous. In this danger, some emerged to begin journeys to heal themselves and their communities in more ways than one. During the pandemic and rise in awareness around racial blackness, I entered the inner space of self to address my fears, worries, and faults. I entered a new state of being where I surrendered to an uncontrollable and external circumstance. In that surrender, I found strength to continue creating art that heals, that shifts perspectives and reimagines the world in, in, in impossible ways. I imagine the spaces of creation and destruction they are one and the same. As light and darkness emerge from the, from the void, so it is returned. And in this endless cycle, we come to understand a new sense of self, an ever-evolving self that is not bound to social identity structures. In life, we experience many deaths, our past selves returning to the void. And so here we are at the end of it all, which is also the beginning. I wish to share with you my newest project, Dark Matter. I had the pleasure of working on this project at the Visual Studies Workshop during my residency there last month. 
And so I'd like to share with you this short video from a digital mock-up of the book, which is still a work in progress. This project is an experimental book that I'm creating that incorporates representational and abstract images, self-portraits, and original writing and poetry. I'm using a new visual language to, dis to discuss topics of expansive blackness, the void, the self, cosmology, death, and rebirth. The white pages with text and bitmapped black images will actually be printed on black paper. I want this book to fully encompass the range, complexity, and legacy of blackness. Every choice made with this book positions blackness at the forefront. Dark matter expands racial blackness to emotional blackness, temporal blackness, spatial blackness, and spiritual blackness, and situates them at the core of existence. The title of the book comes from a scientific study on dark matter and cosmology. Dark matter is speculated to account for over 90% of matter in the universe. It is an invisible particle that does not interact with the electromagnetic spectrum we use to measure the observable world. We have no way to detect dark matter and rely on visible effects in space to tell us that something exists in the space of nothingness. Dark matter is said to account for the missing mass needed to bind galaxies together. From my perspective, I see dark matter as the essential and foundational function of the universe. Without it, everything would cease to exist as we know it. Inspired by the ideas in liquid blackness, I began to create new sensorial experiences with blackness in this book. Abstract images emerge from this series to shadow the expectations of the viewer to make them question what it is they're looking at, to activate their imagination and pull from it new visions of life and reality. I employ black paper, images and text to direct the viewer to engage with the material of the page and its content. Reflections of the cosmos upon earth are revisited. The interplay of light and shadow exists within all forms. The veil of separation of earth and sky is lifted. And we are thrust back down into the depths of blackness, back to the primordial waters of life. And we return to blackness as, or, as origin point. Dark matter addresses the ways society interacts with and thinks about blackness. I reverse the negative, narr the negative narrative and construct a space where blackness is creation. It affects everyone on the globe from the darkest depths of the oceans to caverns embedded in the far reaches of the earth and the expansiveness of space, we all come into contact with blackness. Through my art practice, I lift the veil on racial constructs that limit and obscure selfhood and personal sovereignty, allowing me to peer into the essence of identity. I lift the veil between the physical and spiritual worlds and freely move between what exists in the mind and soul and body. And to end the night, I have one last poem I would like to read to you from this project, Dark Matter. Blackness is born, blackness dies, blackness reforms, blackness rise. Spilling, splashing, covering all. Open your senses, hear the call. Blackness together, black evolves. Absence of light, colors combined, we are everything entwined. Black is, black isn't. Flowing, curving, bending its form, morphing, colliding, conjuring the storm, breaking, building, changing, movement time, only space remaining, blackness. Thank you. Thank you, Granville. Um, we've got just a little bit of time here uh, before we have to uh, get out of the theater uh, for the film this evening. Uh, if there are any questions, um, because we can't share the mic, 
Uh, you can raise your hand if you have a question, and if you'd like to yell the question at the stage. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear you. If they can't, I can repeat the question on the microphone. Does anybody have any questions? Dennis, you want to give it a shot? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Granville, let me, if you don't mind, I'll repeat the gist of the question uh, in case anybody on the other half of the uh, space couldn't hear. Uh, the question was essentially the difference in the, the making process between the earlier work and the new book and, and kind of what that the differences were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for a while I had been thinking about creating a book project. Um, so I finally just said, okay, let's go for it. Um, so if you've noticed, most of my work is digital composites um, using Photoshop to construct these images. Uh, so a lot of the images that I do take don't get used or shown. Um, so I pondered and I was thinking like, you know, I have all these images, thousands and thousands of these images saved in my hard drive that n have never seen the light of day. And I really wanted to readdress them um, and give them some time and energy um, to have an impact on the world. And so I went through my archives, um, pulling from it, you know, images that I felt could be used for this, this idea to expand blackness, um, and then use those images from the archives to then inform the new images I would take uh, as I am working on the book. So it is different aesthetically in some ways, because I love to work with color. Um, but it's still very much connected, you know, conceptually to what it is that I'm doing. Um, and part of it was also, I wanted to challenge myself to create something different uh, because I'm very used to creating digital composites, working on the computer. Uh, I told myself, don't use composites and don't do self-portraits, um, <laughs> which eventually changed. Uh, so the version that I showed all of you is version six of the book. Uh, in the earlier versions, there were literally no composites or self-portraits. Um, but after going through, having conversations with individuals um, about the book, I decided to bring it in. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? I thought I saw a hand over here. Oh, so let me explain. So the video that I showed is not actual the artwork. Um, so that's a digital mock-up of the book design and in design. Uh, I don't work with film, but it is something I wish to work with in the future. Um, so yeah, so that was just a way to, to bring it into a digital format, such as a presentation, um, and share the book with you, uh, instead of sitting here with my mock-up, you know, saying, look at these little itty-bitty pages, you know. Um, but it is interesting because a lot of people have commented or asked me about film or moving image in relation to my digital work. Um, so that is something that, you know, I do think about. Uh, I just haven't really taken the time to dive into that, that process quite yet. Um, if I could expand on that question a little bit, I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think really just kind of talking about the relationship between the still images that you from the early, from your earlier works uh, and kind of how those not necessarily how those could act as moving images but kind of they're so cinematic in their quality mm -hmm. like what is the your relationship or like uh, is cinema something that you're thinking about as you're creating these works is that getting close okay okay. <laughs> 
No, I don't. I don't think about cinema quality. I do think about it as um, a visual narrative, you know, a story, if you will, um, that's loosely sort of connected, um, you know, to allow gaps for the viewer to sort of fill in with their own projections and, and imagination. Uh, I am influenced by a lot of film, uh, so maybe that's, you know, playing into the way that I'm constructing these images. Um, but it isn't consciously at the forefront of my mind when I'm creating these. Um, we've got time for one more question. I can ask the question if no one else has one. Okay. Uh, Granville, I was um, interested in like your relationship with science and it, it seems to play such an important part in your work. Do you have a background in um, in any of the sciences or anything is it or is it just kind of personal exploration that you've been kind of researching mm -hmm. um, so I don't have like a degree or anything in science um, throughout like high school junior high and then my earlier years in college I did take a lot of science classes um, in addition to the requirements that uh, that you know you have to take um, initially I wanted to be a doctor and was really interested in like the human body and the form and trying to understand what that was. But I suck at math, so I was like, I can't do that. Um, and then I, when I began college, uh, I was studying psychology. Um, so that's you know a form of science. Um, and then ended up in art. So a lot of the classes that I've taken, like astronomy, human anatomy and physiology, um, earth sciences, things of that sort, um, you know, do play a part in the way that I create these images, conceptualize them, and um, and so forth. So yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see all of those things melding together into the work. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Granville. Um, I'm ha so happy to have you all back. <laughs> <laughs>